Uh, greetings, my Canadian friends and colleagues. Uh, first of all, let me thank my good friend, Dr. Kevin Washka, for this kind invitation to present the Canadian Digestive Disease Week Richard McKenna Memorial Lecture. I'm grateful for this opportunity, and let us begin. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. John Storline, Mr. Charles Butt, Ms. Angela Deal for their support, as well as my institution, the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. I do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Now coming to the title of my talk for the 2021 McKenna Memorial Lecture, Think outside the endoscopy suite to teach endoscopy. So, let me start with a case to make the point. Here is an endoscopist who is trying to resect a polyp. In order to do it, he needs to figure out first whether the polyp is benign or not. Second, can he cut it completely or not? And third, whether he can cut it safely or not. And, has he, and as he processes the information in his mind, his trained assistant, who learned the skills on the job, is also figuring out what all equipment is needed for the next steps and be ready. All these steps are part of what we call cognitive aspects of endoscopy. Then, cutting, the execution of the cut is the technical or motor skill of endoscopy. If you allow me, we could simplify endoscopy training into cognitive aspects of endoscopy training and technical aspects of endoscopy training. I would like to set this scene to present two important topics. Number one, how to teach cognitive aspects of endoscopy to a larger audience beyond the confines of endoscopy suite. Number two, how to train endoscopy technicians before they join us by developing a dedicated training program in a community college similar to what surgical techs go through nowadays. So, now let us look at the history of endoscopy. When you look back, most of us, including the generation of fellows before COVID-19 pandemic, followed a traditional time-honored path of learning. Flexible endoscopy training started with Dr. Basil Hershewitz, who invented fiber optic endoscopy and opened a new path for gastroenterologists beyond prescribing antacids, laxatives, antibiotics, and steroids. Then, most of us, including my generation, learned endoscopy with the help of teaching attachments from our mentors. Later, pioneers like Peter Cotton started expanding the teaching program to larger groups using TV camera attachments. And for over 30 years, Professor Norman Markan and his team helped many of us learn from his famous Toronto Live Endoscopy courses. I attended one of these courses during the early part of my career. I enjoyed it very much and returned back to my institution rejuvenated. It was a surreal experience, almost like going on a pilgrimage. Although it was a fantastic experience, we all know that only a few hundred could make it. The vast majority of endoscopists could not benefit from that rich experience provided in Toronto. Around the turn of the millennium, something interesting happened. An alternative path to learn the cognitive aspects of endoscopy 
opened up to those who could not afford the pilgrimage to Toronto. Let me share that story. Here is Dr. Peter Kelsey from Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston, who came up with a brilliant idea, video clips as a teaching tool. He came up with this idea during the Digestive Disease Week in New Orleans in the early 2000s. When he came up with the idea, he quickly borrowed a laptop from Dr. Bill Brugge and spent the rest of the time during his stay in New Orleans in a hotel plotting the game plan for the Digital Atlas of Video Education, a new concept, a new internet-based digital video atlas for educational purposes to serve the endoscopists. This is known as the DAVE project. A couple of years later, they presented the DAVE project at DDW and won the prestigious ASGE Audiovisual Award. I must share with you that this is an educational milestone in the dissemination of endoscopy knowledge. As true educators, they did not stop there. They took the next step to teach others in the art of video editing and video production. Peter Kelsey, Brenna Casey, and Bill Brugge organized a video editing training program in Park City. It is a beautiful place. You all know about Park City, a beautiful place to ski, but I was the wrong person to go to Park City. Hailing from South India, I did not have a clue about skiing, but, did, but that did not bother me when I checked into the room and found a gift bag. Could you guess what was in that bag? You lead video studio package, a video editing software. I usually go to bed at 10 p.m. I do not know what happened to me that night. I opened the package, found some diskettes, loaded the software program to my computer, and then I spent the whole night reading the instruction manual and practiced step-by-step step how to video edit. That was one of the best nights of learning in my life, and you will not believe if I said it changed my career trajectory. The following day, we graduated. Here is our graduation ceremony picture with Dan Collier, who provided IT support for the Dave project, sitting on the left side, followed by Dr. Brenna Bounds, Dr. Peter Kelsey, and Dr. Bill Brugge towards the right. After an exciting week of learning, I returned home to my institution, and this is the Old Red, the original medical school building of the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, where I worked as a mid-level faculty member. And let me share with you how I benefited from the schooling in video editing and learning the art of video journalism. Video production skills help me with my scientific publications. You know, around that time, in 2005, we were in the midst of natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery, otherwise known as Notes fever. I started working on endoscopic closure of colon perforations in the lab, but being a newcomer and with no track record in experimental endoscopy, I wondered and doubted whether, an, whether any editor-in-chief would take my work seriously. Fortunately, videos to document my experimental work helped me convince them and get published. In addition, I started teaching video editing skills to anyone interested in learning, whether they were medical students or residents or GI fellows, and some learned the skill and ended up publishing their videos 
in the Dev project. It's interesting to observe how this teaching, how this teaching venture panned out. Medical students, residents, and fellows pitched their video editing skills to the program directors and ended up in their chosen training programs. It is certainly a very satisfying experience to watch medical students become residents, residents join GI Fellowship, and GI Fellows go on to advanced endoscopy fellowships. After having seen some success locally in Galveston, we explored how to take it to the next level. I mean, scaling up the operation. Whenever you want to scale up an operation, you need people with influence to bat for you. And for us, the timing cannot be more than perfect. At that time, I was working with Ken McQuaid in the ASGE PGE committee, along with Dr. Kevin Washke. He remembers that. Ken McQuaid believed in the idea and batted for that. And Ken McQuaid made it happen. He obtained approval from the ASGE governing board, reached out to the Dave project team, who agreed to develop an ASGE video editing training program for trainees. I hope you recognize Dr. Nina Abraham in the back row on the right side. I'm sure you must be thinking, nothing happens without a Canadian on board. And 2007 was a pivotal year. We started the ASGE Video Editing Scholarship Program. This was a weekend course dedicated to teaching video editing skill. The ASGE staff, Kim and Michelle, who personally ran the logistics of arranging flights, hotel, and program to make it happen. It was totally free of charge to the fellow. Special thanks to Mr. David Woods, then president of Pentax, who agreed to support it with a $100,000 grant per year. And Pentax also provided the scholars, each one with a laptop fully loaded with video capture software, along with cables to connect to the endoscopy processor and record video, and also video editing software to edit the videos. On Saturday morning that weekend, Dr. Peter Kelsey and Brenna Bounds ran the program and taught the art of video editing step by step. I must stress here that this is a totally new skill for all the trainees. And the trainees followed one step at a time to learn the video editing skill. Then after a lunch break in the afternoon on Saturday, the trainees were divided into small groups. This was my group. I must add here with great satisfaction, I served as their personal tutor. Here, the trainees practiced further to produce their first six-minute video with audio narration. Our current editor-in-chief of Video GIE is Dr. Field Willingham. He graduated from this program, and you can see him on the left side of this image working in my group. On Sunday, the trainees reviewed the videos that each, of, each one of them produced and selected the top two from each group for presentation to the course directors who provided feedback on video editing skills and production skills so that they could refine their craft. You can see here the first batch of ASG video editing scholars in 2007. I'll come back to this picture a little later. Let us see what they did a year later at DDW. I'm talking about the output of this ASG video editing scholarship program. How many of them made the cut 
to present at the ASGE video plenary session at DDW. As our president, Dr. Kevin Washke can attest, getting to the podium presentation at the ASGE video plenary session is tough. Only 15 to 20 percent make it. I'm excited to share that a third of them came from the video editing scholars. This is a very satisfying experience to all of us. It helped us to continue the program every year before the advanced endoscopy fellows started their own clinical training. And over the next six years, we trained 200 scholars in the art of video editing. And when things are going well in life, we all feel good. And you know, smooth seas do not make skillful sailors. This is a beautiful African proverb. And what happened was, industry leadership changed hands and we lost funding. It was disappointing to me and many future students. Then a call came in 2013 from Dr. Amitabh Chak, who has been conducting advanced endoscopy fellows course every year in Cleveland, along with Dr. John Vargo from the Cleveland Clinic. He wanted to see if we could include video editing training in this particular course. He came up with the suggestion, hey, Raju, how about teaching the course in three to four hours? Imagine now, converting a 16-hour course with $100,000 funding support to one that should be done in four hours and with no financial support, zip. That was the challenge. In my own mind as a teacher, I had to figure out what to teach and how to teach given these constraints. So the first step was to break down the game, the learning material into multiple action steps. How do you record an endoscopy video? How do you transfer the video from the recorder to the computer? How do you edit the video step by step? And then putting things together into a final product. And once I figured this out, and I followed those steps, and we created learning videos, uploaded them to my own YouTube channel, and created a playlist for video editing skill learning a couple of months before the course started. And then we sent the learning material to the advanced fellows attending the course a month in advance using Google Drive. And this is how we del delivered the learning material. When the trainees came, having already practiced the art, all we did was showcase the e editing of one of the videos in front of them from start to finish and left ample time for discussion. At that time, I did not have a clue about flipped classroom approach to education. Later, when I learned about flipped classroom style of teaching, I felt good about pulling it off without knowing the concepts. I guess when you want to do something seriously, you will figure out one way or the other. Like we saw at the ASG headquarters, the students of Amitabh Chak's course did the same. Each one produced a video, the group reviewed the videos, and selected the best one from their group and presented to the faculty. And they received feedback from the very best in the field. Here is the first batch who learned video editing on a shoestring budget using a flipped classroom concept by bringing their own Macs and doing it on iMovie. By the end of 2019, before the COVID started in 2020, we trained 420 video editing scholars, including some from Canada, Europe, and Australia. And as an educator, 
I cherish this opportunity to be part of these brilliant young minds' careers. And when I reflect back to the first batch of ASG video editing scholars in 2007, many of them became established as excellent academicians. Some became associate editors of journals and Dr. Field Willingham now serves as the editor-in-chief of Video GIE. It is a great feeling to have. I shared with you how we developed video journalists over the last 15 years. It was a fun journey. Now let me take you through how the society developed video journal, Video GIE, as a platform for the video journalists shoot, to showcase their talent. So let me take you through what all the editor-in-chief, starting with Dr. George Stradafalopoulos, did. Here is Dr. George Stradafalopoulos, editor-in-chief of GIE. I had the special privilege of working with him. And I encourage all the trainees and faculty interested in journalism to read his vision statement for the journal in 2005. He wanted to make the journal a high-tech journal and was the first editor to encourage including a video clip with the manuscripts. I certainly benefited from his vision when I was doing my own perforation closure work. Next editor was Dr. Glenn Eisen, who took over from Dr. George Stradafalopoulos. And Glenn took it to the next step, from a video clip in a manuscript to the development of Video GIE as a concept and incubated it in GIE. GIE started publishing video articles as full-length articles. I'm delighted to work with Todd Barron as my co-editor to start this venture. And you can see on the right our first article published in GIE. The project took off like wildfire. Between 2013 and 2016, we received over 700 submissions and accepted over 450 articles. The American Society for GI Endoscopy Governing Board appreciated the potential of video GIE. And here, Dr. Doug Fagel, during his presidency, gave green light to work on the launch of video GIE as an independent journal. Again, back to Park City. I don't know something about Park City. All the ideas happen in Park City. We started working on the architecture and design of the journal from February to August of 2016 while still incubating it and let the journal grow inside GIE. And Dr. Mike Wallace, the current editor-in-chief, announced the official launch of the journal at DDW in 2016. By this time, Video GIE proved to be ready to be delivered and take a life of its own. As you can see, the red star marks indicate the number of articles published in GIE, 20 Video GIE articles. There is a lot of interest among the young endoscopists to send video submissions. We launched Video GIE in September 2016, and this is the only print version of the journal. We wanted to include the following types of articles. Something for everyone. Innovations and new methods for advanced endoscopists. Basics of endoscopy techniques for beginners and standard practice techniques for practicing endoscopists and meet the master series for all of us to pay tribute to our masters and mentors. So let me take a couple of steps and take you through what is there in this journal. 
So let me take you through this case. This helps uh, teaching medical students, residents and fellows and excite them to become gastroenterologists. So here is a case published uh, in the first issue of the journal. A 61-year-old male presented with dyspnea and chest pain. His past medical history was significant for diabetes, coronary artery disease, status post PCI times 3, esophageal cancer, and gastric cancer positive for candida. So because of chest pain and dyspnea, he undergoes an EKG, which shows some changes in the inferior leads, and a chest x-ray that shows some air in the pericardium. And a barium study shows a gastropericardial fistula. And uh, during endoscopy, you can see what happens. A big fistula between the stomach and the heart, or the pericardium, and you can see the heart pulsating. i never seen a heart pulsating with an endoscope before. And the biopsies from the pericardium showed candida. The patient underwent surgery, clearance of the pericardial sac of all the infected material, followed by the closure of the fistula. The patient did well. So this is a beautiful case that talks about the whole spectrum of pathology where we could see what exactly happened. Let's go to another case. This helps in planning the management of a difficult case by looking at what others have done before. I've actually benefited by looking at video GIE. When I had a case of a jejunal intersusception and my surgeon asked me, can you uh, reduce this jejunal intersusception. I told him that it doesn't make sense. But when I looked at the video GIE, there was a case report that my colleague accepted it. And uh, you can see here, this is a U.S. guided gastrojejunostomy created because of complete duodenal obstruction. After creating a LAMS procedure, you go through and reach the uh, obstructed uh, biliary duct and then try to achieve clearance of that bile duct stent. So if you have a tough case and say, how am I going to deal with this? You could come to video GIE and look at it and plan your procedure. Sometimes what happens is things might happen as you're doing a case and when you are in trouble, you could quickly search for that article and see if you could fix the problem. So here is a jejunal perforation that happened during enteroscopy. And if that happens, you can pull up video GIE for an article and see what they have done. And uh, here they closed it with clips. And then if you know how to use the clips, you can just apply that and try to take care of the patient. So these are the applications that Video GIE can offer in your practice. All right. It also helps patients uh, get educated about procedures. Say, for example, you want to do an EMR on a patient and you want to give them educational material that's also available in Video GIE. Our goal for the journal was to make information available to anyone with internet access from around the globe, irrespective of whether they are ASG members or not. Hence, we went with the open access online journal format to reach that wider audience so that patients, endoscopists, nurses, technicians, trainees, and industry partners could benefit. I finished my tenure at the end of 2020, December, as the editor-in-chief, along with my partner with whom I started, Dr. Todd Barron. I'm grateful to him, and I'm also grateful to my 
associate editors Dr. Shu Tang and Dr. Ryan La, and to my managing editors Ms. Deborah Bauman and Stephanie Kanan, and to Michael Wallace, editor of GIE, who gave me advice along the way. I'm grateful to the AAC for this opportunity to work on this project. I appreciate the support of many friends around the world who made this project possible because this was a transition for endoscopists from regular publications to an open access journal. And I hope this story helps trainees learn that they can venture out and do things outside the regular scope of work of just scoping, think about scoping out opportunities outside scoping. And with your permission, let me dedicate this lecture that I prepared to my mentor and my good friend, Dr. Peter Kelsey, who excited, who excited me to think outside the endoscopy suite to teach. And let me thank you all for your time. I wish I was there in person celebrating the presidency of my good friend. Thank you.